Hey, how are you? Hey, I am great. I know for our audience, today is, well, I don't know, very early in October. And yet, it is the first day of April as we record. And so baseball is brand new. It is back in my life and I am feeling fantastic. Yesterday was Easter. That was amazing. My kids are back from India. That was amazing. Yeah, it's a good day. How are you? I am doing very well. It is, as you said, the day after Easter. And I really enjoyed my first Easter as a parishioner at a church. I got to attend a Good Friday service and attend an Easter service without having to make them happen. Mm. And I really enjoyed being able to sit and worship and reflect on those days. And it's been really good. And so, yeah, I think I'm just, I'm good. That is fantastic. That is fantastic. Well, so a note to our audience then about why this is being recorded in April and released in October. This is the first of five anticipated conversations about the book of Revelation. And rather than study the book all year long and then try to record five episodes, we decided we would read a book and then sit down and talk about it and record an episode that has as its theme, the same theme from that book. And then uh, we would read another book and sit down and do the same thing and then release them all together as a whole. And so this is the first of those conversations. And as our book, we have read Reading Revelation Responsibly by Michael Gorman. And I love the subtitle of this book. Uh, he subtitles this uncivil worship and witness following the lamb into the new creation. Boy, there's a lot to unpack there. Kidding, huh? You could sit, do an entire episode just on that one phrase without ever even getting into the book. There's so much. And, and I appreciate this, by the way. He did a great job of hacking his entire book into that title. Yes. I, yeah, completely agree. More than any book I've ever read. That subtitle is, okay, here is your thesis in a subtitle. Yeah. So he does a masterful job with this book, and he does exactly what his title says he's going to do. So can you share with everybody, why did we choose this book to be our first look? And by the way, neither of us are like revelation nerds. In fact, I think I'm describing us accurately. I think we have hitherto been revelation avoiders. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is genuinely for me, my first in-depth look at the book of Revelation. Yeah, me too. I remember reading the book of Revelation through once very intentionally in high school, college age, kind of early 20s. And then, of course, since then, I've read it when it was part of a Bible reading plan or whatever. But I definitely have come out of a strand of evangelicalism that emphasized Revelation in, a way, in ways that I didn't find helpful. And so I have been, like you, I think, somewhat avoidant. But I'm curious. I think you put this book on our reading list I don't know that I had heard of it before. I can tell you why I wanted it first, but I'm curious if you have a backstory on why you picked this book for the list at all. Yeah. So all throughout seminary, this book came up every single time Revelation was mentioned. And I was like, okay, I have to read this. Plus, I am familiar with Michael Gorman's work in his book, Cruciformity, which was phenomenal. And so I just knew him to be a good and careful scholar. And the fact that this book in particular had been referenced so many times with Revelation, I was like, okay, this is the one of the first books I need to read post-seminary. So I was really intrigued on that score. But then secondly, exactly like what we just talked about, we're both 
revelation avoiders. And I think I've been an avoider simply because of all of the bad theology and wild speculation and cuckoo-ness that has happened around Revelation. And so when I'm presented with a title like reading Revelation responsibly, I'm like, yes, please. (laughs) That's exactly what I want. And I would love to start there because I feel like at the very least, I know whether or not I agree with a word he has to say, we're not dealing with the cuckoo interpretation of Revelation. And we're really going to be diving into a responsible reading of Revelation. And I needed to start there in order to break down my own barriers around this book. Yeah, exactly. I need a framework. So we were originally going to start with Revelation through Old Testament eyes, which I'm super excited to do. Uh, However, it gets into the weeds of the book fairly quickly. And before getting into the weeds of the book, I just felt like I needed to be offered an alternative framework that I was even marginally okay with before getting into the details. Because I knew I didn't like the framework I had, but I didn't have an alternative framework. Yes. No, you're exactly right. And I feel like, as you said already, he outlines that framework in the subtitle of this book, Uncivil Worship and Witness, Following the Lamb into the New Creation. And so I feel like this book offers two really, really good kind of overview starting points. One, what's the genre? What are we reading here? And so I'd love to dive in there. But then also this idea of following the lamb. And he makes a big, big deal over this concept of following the lamb. So I'm hoping we get a chance to talk about that again to, er, as well today. Yeah, absolutely. I think these are the two pieces that he offers to the discussion. In terms of what are we reading, the genre, the two chapters on this that he writes, chapters two and three of his book, uh, which are titled, What Are We Reading the Form of Revelation? And then What Are We Reading the Substance of Revelation? really break this up in what I found to be a really helpful way, sort of giving us five clues or five fixed points that we can hang our hats on as far as the the form and substance of what we're reading. And I think his sort of breakdown of this is just masterful. Yeah, I really appreciated that as well. And I think the reason I did was he wasn't trying to paint with too broad of a brush. He wasn't just saying, this entire book is blank. Because he really tips his cap and acknowledges this is a book with multiple genres in it. This is a letter. This is prophecy. This is apocalypse or apocalyptic literature. It is kind of all of these things. It's uh, it, all of these things mixed into one and, and even more than that. And so I appreciate the fact that he wasn't just getting a, you know, so, well, this is apocalyptic literature, and this is what you need to know about apocalyptic literature. And all right, let's dive in. He was more nuanced. Yeah, very much so. And throughout the entire book, he continues to sort of portmanteau these words into new words in order to help us remember that we need to be remember thinking about multiple genres at the same time. Even the way he starts this off He pulls a quote from a Richard Bauckham book that we're going to be reading soon as well, uh, saying Revelation is an apocalyptic prophecy in the form of a circular letter. Yes. And even that, it's this kind of very crimmed down phrase, but it captures the fact that just in pure form, you constantly have to be juggling these three different balls. Yeah. And that's the sense I got from these chapters as well, as kind of these three different balls. But you mentioned already that he's got five categories. Do you mind just listing those really quick? Sure. So in terms of form, he talks about the fact that this is an apocalyptic work, a prophetic work, and a letter. 
And those are his three key form elements. And then as far as substance, he says there's really two things to identify. Uh, one is that this is a liturgical text. That is to say, it's a text that's about worship and discipleship. And then second, as far as substance goes, he says that this is a merging of what he calls a liturgical text. That is to say, something that is specifically about worship and discipleship. And second, something that a, a, a theopolitical text that is, and I love this, this is a, a subtitle that he has for one of the sections in that chapter. He says, it is a theopolitical text, a critique of empire and a manifesto against civil religion. Yes. Which, yes, I want to get to so bad, but I want to stick with genre for just a minute. I'm really, I'm saying all this out loud to hold myself back. Uh, I know. So... Yeah. It's, I'm, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm curious, you know, if we look at those three kind of form words, letter, apocalypse, and prophecy, I'm curious what your takeaway was from, uh, you know, I, for me, the big one of these three is the idea of apocalypse. And so I'm curious what your takeaway is from his writing about the idea of apocalypse and how it relates to reading Revelation. Yeah. So oddly enough, apocalypse is something that I had, that's kind of been drilled into me about Revelation already. And so my takeaway is not what he had to say about apocalypse, but his balancing of that with the prophetic and the letter genres that are still present within Revelation as well. But a, a backing up to apocalypse, right? Apocalyptic literature is kind of a, a point in time genre that it maybe spans a few centuries. And I don't know, it's a very dramatic, very um, caricature-ish type of literature with a lot of symbolism, but a lot of, I almost imagine it as like, this is really not an, a, a, a scholarly interpretation, but I, I can imagine like a kid doodling in class and has this great artistic ability and he draws these fantastical beasts and then he starts assigning meaning to these beasts and he starts like giving them symbols that signify things that he sees around him. And then he creates another character and that character has all sorts of meaning and symbolism. And then he creates this whole world that dramatically re-envisions his own world and it then starts circulating it and people start seeing their world, their contemporary world in a different light all through this dramatic storytelling of this great artist and visionary. I know that's not necessarily how a, a scholar would describe it, but that's what comes to my mind. Well, and he uses a very similar illustration. Uh, so he, at least one scholar is willing to go there with you. Okay. Um, all right. I was so grateful for his use of the idea of a political cartoon as a way of understanding apocalypse and prophecy. Mm. You know, the idea is there is a supernatural reality that is deeply invasive of our natural reality. And the idea of a political cartoon as a way of understanding how these two things merge together. And the symbolism idea, when I was a teenager, for years and years, as long as I lived at my parents' house, I had in my room an original print of an early 1900s political cartoon from the Providence Journal, the major paper where I grew up. And it was in reference to the ice delivery men. Uh, back in the 1900s, in order they didn't have electricity, and so they would deliver ice to individual homes to put in your ice box so that you could keep your food cold. And this particular cartoon was criticizing the idea that the ice men were charging too much for the ice, but it caricatured them as these semi-human, semi-beast-like kind of, I don't, I think they were like giant 
gorillas or something like that. And they were sort of turned into Godzilla. And they were laughing at all the people that they, as they were tearing off their clothes and walking away with everything they had, leaving them embarrassingly naked. And the idea of the cartoon wasn't that the Icemen were actually turning into gorillas, nor was it that they were going around actually ripping the clothes off of their customers. It was simply that they were robbing them blind and therefore they were horrible people. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Political cartoon, as you just described it, is a perfect way to understand what apocalyptic literature is. It's a highly charactered depiction of what is actually happening. And you have to see through the symbolism, not see through the symbolism. I think we have to do that today. But I think the original audience would have seen their world in a new light through the symbolism. Yeah. The symbolism is evocative, right? Like the point of making the Iceman look like Godzilla was to emotionally say, these are horrible, horrible people who are taking advantage of the rest of us. And yeah, it was deeply evocative. And even just printing out that line in a newspaper would not have been as evocative as this wonderful drawing. And, and yes. so many of the images in the book of Revelation, if we allow our imaginations to engage with them, which is one of my big takeaways from him. Uh, yeah, he, mine too. Is let your imagination engage the imagery. Let your feelings engage the imagery. Let them carry you away. Don't be too analytical about it. Just get lost in the images, and you're more likely to be where the author was trying to get you. Yes. I want to say this. I'll, he kind of summarizes this idea in the very last little portion of his book. He calls it the postlude. And he says, he encourages us to take away from the book of Revelation a number of different words. The first pair of words is look and listen. And he says this about it. This is a book of visions and auditions. In other words, things that you see and things that you hear. It invites us to cast our eyes on the lamb that was slaughtered. It invites us to see him as the way both to God and the way of God. We meditate on the atoning character of his death, but also on his faithful witness and death. We open our ears individually and corporately to the spirit who is constantly speaking to the church. And this is what John does throughout the entire book of Revelation. I looked and I saw, or then I heard, right? He is tipping us off to the visionary and auditory experience that is the book of Revelation. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that. That leads me into the differentiation he makes between apocalyptic and prophecy. Apocalyptic is inviting us to use our imaginations to sort of see behind the curtain to what's really going on, to see the world anew, to see the world afresh. And then yeah. his thinking about what prophecy is, and I, I love that, again, I'm going to quote here from chapter two. Prophecy is speaking words of comfort and or challenge on behalf of God to the people of God in their concrete historical situation. Comfort and challenge. So apocalyptic lets you know what's happening. Prophecy is God's word to you in the midst of that new understanding of what's happening. And sometimes that's comforting. Sometimes that's challenging. Yeah, no, you're exactly right, which brings me to this form of letter. It begins with God commanding John to the churches of you know Asia, write this. And he says to the church of Pergamum, write this. And to the church of Smyrna, write this. The entire context of this book is in the form of a letter. In other words, a concrete thing being sent to actual people in an actual space and time under certain circumstances. This is a historical reality, a moment in time. This isn't just predicting the future or something like that. This is a letter sent to actual human beings enduring actual things, and it's meant to speak to them in that historical moment. So it's a letter 
which has a historical context. But then it's also, as you said, prophecy. This is God's word to that people in the midst of that context. And his analysis of that original context, one phrase that he uses several times that I think we need to come back to when we get to the theopolitical context is the phrase ordinary empire. In other words, this is not a book that is written to the church when it was facing extraordinary persecution. This is a book that was written to the church when it was existing in the midst of ordinary daily life in an empire. Mm -hmm. And I just want to point out the fact that when we think of a circular letter and the immediate original context of that letter, the way we read that context is going to have significant implications. And I have, I think, most of my life been taught that Revelation was written to an extremely persecuted church. And the more I have studied church history and understood the the later half of the first century, and that tying up in what Gorman says in this book, that is not what was actually happening. Right. Yeah, I loved his perspective there. There were definitely some isolated persecutions around the latter part of the first century, but they were certainly not widespread and persistent. Uh, that did come, just not yet. And so, yeah, I love this idea of ordinary empire, where, of course, there is some tension between your faith and the empire in which you live. But really what he's calling out, and I can't wait to get to this, is the insidiousness of how the ethos of the empire makes its way into the church. Yeah, which is, by the way, far more consistent with chapters two and three of Revelation, which speak frequently so that in those individual letters to the churches of the subtle ways in which faith can be corrupted. Those letters make more sense to me as an introduction to this book as a whole, if the whole book is addressing Christians in the context of ordinary empire. Yes. Yes. Oh, all right. We're almost there, yes. but we've got to talk right. about this idea of the liturgical. Yes, I was just going to. So what did you think of that? Because I, this is almost brand new for me as a point of understanding how and why Revelation is written. Yes, I agree. And so liturgical being an act of worship, and that concept I have to say, has been the most true for me since beginning this Revelation study. Not only are we reading these five books, but we are also reading and rereading the book of Revelation itself. And I have to say that the heavenly vision of God on the throne and the crucified lamb and the 24 elders and the angels surrounding the throne and all of this scene of the throne room has swirled in my head almost on a constant basis since we began this. And it has invoked worship. It was amazing to go through Holy Week this way. It was amazing to continue to think even on Easter of the resurrection of Jesus, but yet he is still depicted as the crucified lamb in Revelation. So this idea of worship as a main component of the book of Revelation feels true to me, right? Regardless of the theology of it, or he doesn't have to convince me of that, my own engagement with the book tells me that's true. But he helps illuminate that a little bit for me because he does talk about all the different moments in the book that are related to worship. And, you know, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty— all of the different songs that we have sung, you know, even the band Casting Crowns, right, gets its name from this book. And so on and on we could go in terms of tracing our own worship and our own visions that we've included in our lyrics. And it's all right here in Revelation. Yes. And 
two things here that I think are interesting. You know, if we turn to our political cartoon analogy in Revelation 4 and 5 with the Lamb on the throne, I find it very helpful to think in terms of a political cartoon that John is describing a supernatural reality as a lamb on a throne. He's not saying he literally saw a lamb on a throne. He's saying that the most important aspect of Jesus' reality that shone through in this moment of revelation was his self-sacrificing and liturgical self-sacrificing, sort of calling back to the whole Old Testament. The fact that Jesus becomes this sacrifice for sin and that he does it voluntarily and that that's what elevates him to the throne, I think is wildly important as we then begin to ask questions about the trumpets and bowls and all of that. Right. Well, John himself makes it central, right? He has all of this dramatic lead up where here's this scroll with the seven seals. And the question is asked, who is worthy to open these seals? And they look and they go, nobody, nobody was found. They looked and they looked and they looked and they couldn't find anybody. And John weeps, which is so evocative. Mm -hmm. He weeps because nobody could open the scroll. And then it's revealed that the lamb, the one that was crucified, that is the one that is worthy. But the one who died, that makes him worthy. And as he opens the scroll, all of the rest of the book unfolds from that scroll. And these moments that you see throughout the rest of the book are all because Jesus was worthy. The crucified lamb was worthy to bring it into being. And as we look at some of the very complicated images of the rest of the book, he makes this wonderful point that the lamb on the throne is the controlling image of the book. You can't interpret anything in a way that contradicts the fact that it is the slaughtered lamb on the throne. Yeah. And in a book that is often taken to be very violent— I think that's really important. It is. And it's not just some convenient scholarly trick to get us to not focus on the violence. This is literally what the book of Revelation is doing. Like I said, mm -hmm. all of what unfolds happens because the lamb was worthy to open the seal and cause it to unfold. And so it has to be the guiding metaphor. It has to be the actor behind the scenes throughout the entire book, because only the lamb was found to be worthy to do this. So then coming back to this idea of a of liturgical, understanding Revelation as a book that is for worship and for discipleship, I love the fact that his sense of what it means for the book to be those two things is for us as Christians to be faithful witnesses to those things in what we say and do in response to God in the world. Yeah, it's fascinating. He makes kind of a, a loose connection here. I don't think he really emphasizes it throughout the book, but he does let us know that the Greek word martyr mm -hmm. means witness. And so... It's kind of ambiguous as to whether or not witnessing to the Lamb will result in our own death. And for those that were killed for witnessing to the Lamb, you see that in Revelation. You see them be honored and glorified. But then you also have this constant refrain of we as God's people need to be testifying, witnessing, martyring to the Lamb. And even to the point of our own deaths, if it so calls for it. That's the theme. Which, you know, and again, I, I appreciated what he said here because I think being martyred misses the point. Witnessing mm. to the death of the lamb, even up to my own death, 
has a sort of reflection or parallelism that speaks to what I think discipleship is about in this book. The essence and soul of Jesus who ascends to the ultimate throne is that he is going to do his work by self-sacrifice. And it is my invitation and challenge from the book. It is the prophetic call of the book that I am invited to do the same. Yeah. You know, over and over and over again, and here we go. We're going into the sec- the fifth section here that I think is so important, and we've been excited to do it. In every one of these five sections in these chapters, the author uses the word resistance every single time. And the call that we have on our lives to be a resistance to empire. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at, uh, this is page 180, and he talks about the need in the church for discernment. And I love how he ties together this idea of worship and this idea of empire. He says, worship offers us an alternative vision of God and of reality that unveils and challenges empire. So we need the Spirit's wisdom and guidance to perform this vision well. If it's crucial that the church not withdraw from life in the world, but only from that which is anti-lamb, how can we know what to withdraw from and what to participate in without the Spirit's gift of discernment? How can it know what its alternative life should look like without the vision that the Spirit gives to those who hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches? And I love that vision of depending on the Holy Spirit to discern, okay, I am called to worship the Lamb. And that means to reject the worship of anything that is anti-Lamb. So what might that look like? What is that? And he boils that down to one word, empire. And he suggests, I think, that the, the water is even muddier today than it would have been in the first century. Uh, There's two things he says that I think are very important here. First of all, he suggests that the word empire and the phrase superpower have significant similarities, which is a great way of suggesting that if you read what the book of Revelation says about empire, the fact that it will have economic dependence all across the world, the fact that it will have significant influence far beyond its own borders. It is hard to read that honestly and not think, oh, yeah, no, the United States, as defined by the book of Revelation, is an empire. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about this because this is a challenging thing, right? To think that this and I'm sorry for the word. I know this is not kosher in our society, but I'm usually using it straight out of Revelation. The whore Babylon and its reference to the evil Roman Empire, all of that horrible depicted language being directed and, and applicable in some way to the United States feels provocative. It feels startling. It feels anti-American, all of those things. And so I approach this with caution. But at the same time, if I'm trying to apply revelation and its polemic against empire in my modern day and time, if I look around at the world, I live in the United States of America, the modern global superpower. If there is an equivalent to empire, I should probably look at the most powerful nation on earth and ask myself, does this in any way resemble the whore Babylon? And am I in danger, like the first century Christians were in danger, of allowing its values to seep into my worship and into my construct of reality? And this is the second thing that I picked up from him and continues to make this messier than it was in the first century. In the first century, the civic religion, which when we use the phrase, or when he uses the phrase civic religion, what he means is a religion that is used by the 
state to give legitimacy or unity to the political realities of the day. Is that a fair summary? Yeah. Uh, So the civic religion in the first century was fundamentally pagan, right? It was worshiping Jupiter and Athena and even the goddess Roma that was the soul of the state. He suggests that the civic religion of the United States has co-opted the language and symbols of Christianity for its own purposes. So the civic religion can use words like Jesus and cross and prayer, but use them for national purposes rather than religious purposes. And that profound blurring of the lines makes it very important to have this discernment that you were talking about. Yeah. And it causes me to question myself and my own engagement in the intersection of religious life and being an American. And I am still struggling with where I draw the line. But these things intersect in a lot of ways that may be neutral, but I need to really question it. Mm -hmm. Things like, you know, growing up, going to like the sea with the pole, a national kind of day of prayer for youth. What could be wrong with that? Well, it also kind of had this American overtone, pray for your country, pray for your leaders, which is not bad. The Bible commands us to do that. I'm not saying these are bad things per se, but I am saying these things intersect in insidious ways that we never stop to question. Things like, you know, the Congress, like having a prayer before they start or flying a national flag right next to a Christian flag at a church, or maybe even having a Christian flag and an uh, American flag on the podium. Or, you know, in this is, as we said, this is April 1st of 2024. And so one of the things that's really big in the news right now is what people are branding the Trump Bible. And, you know, this is a Bible that's actually been around prior to Trump, but Right. It has all of these American things like the Declaration of Independence and various other documents, the words to God bless America printed right next to the King James version of the Bible. And we've blended these things in uncomfortable ways. Absolutely. And in ways that the book of Revelation seems to warn us, we can call it blending or we can call it engagement. But when religious truths are brought into the political sphere, the damage that is done is to the religious truths, not to the political sphere. Yeah. We lose our authenticity if we are not exceptionally careful. Yeah. And I think the way that I can't remember what book this was in. So I apologize to whatever author I am just abusing their intellectual property here, but they spent a good deal of time painting basically a 4th of July church service in America, but using nothing but Roman imagery and how absurd it would seem to us if that was our church service. So replace the American flag with symbols of Rome, replace references to our troops, to images of Roman soldiers, replace like all of the iconography around America and, you know, replace it with Constantine and whatever it is. And all of a sudden, the absurdity of it starts to make a little bit more sense because it removes it from our own context, which this is the water we swim in. We kind of don't even question it. But if you change the script just slightly and insert another nationality, or even if we were to take kind of our political enemies at the moment, right? And so now substitute a celebration of maybe China's government or China's troops or 
you know, Iraq or Iran's troops and government and national propaganda and founding documents and whatever, all of a sudden it doesn't seem like it has quite the place in Christian worship that we might have thought. Oh, man. That's a great point. Imagine printing Mao's little red book in the same binding as the Bible. Yeah. Or even, you know, a similar example to this. Several times I've been on trips down to Central and South America, and I've seen a multitude of churches where the local mythology has been blended with Catholic thought into this sort of very difficult to parse muddying of both of them. And it makes its way into the murals and the art in the churches. And of course, it's so easy to say, clearly that should not be there. This should be purely a space devoted to Jesus. And then we go back home and make sure that the flag is there. (laughs) You right. Know, or we go back home and we show the three minute Fourth of July or Veterans Day video about how important it is to be loyal to our country. In a worship service. Yeah. And this is, I think, Gorman's point all throughout. And what he believes the central point of revelation to be do not mix empire with lamb worship. We have to follow the Lamb into the new creation, not this current empire or the next empire or the empire three doors down. We don't follow these imperial leaders. We follow the crucified Lamb, period, full stop. Don't incorporate anything else into this worship. Yeah, it's the idea of unadulterated worship. Yeah. Which— well. And yeah. that's where part of his subtitle comes in, uncivil worship and witness, following the lamb into the new creation. As you said, his entire book is packed into that subtitle. Yeah. It made me wonder as, as a Christian, sometimes the United States gets criticized by Christians for doing overtly unchristian things, whatever those things may be. But I wondered if the greater danger to us as Christians, based on what Revelation is trying to say, is not the overt moments when the United States is doing unchristian things, but the moments when we hardly even notice that the United States is co-opting our Christianity to sell us on its message. Mm. And we are hook, line, and sinker buying into it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is John's message to the churches. Don't live for the empire. You have to follow the lamb. And and I think that's why it begins as a letter, and it ends with an admonition to the churches, basically, though not in these words, but in the same words that Jesus, like, he who has ears, let him hear. Let him apply the words of this prophecy and live this out. It's, it's a huge challenge then and now. And, you know, we could talk about this for hours, and I'm super excited about our ongoing set of conversations about the book of Revelation, but I think I want to use that as a moment to turn to our audience, if it's okay, just to say, I would love to hear, first of all, your background with the book of Revelation. You know, are are you one of those people who loves it? Are you one of those people who's come to avoid it? What do you initially think about it? How does what we've been talking about today jive with how you traditionally read the book of Revelation? And as we often say, is there somebody you could share this episode with that it would spark a conversation about reading the Bible together and particularly reading Revelation together as we go through this series? Uh, Because we would love to to have you engage in a conversation with us uh, and with those around you about the book of Revelation. Absolutely. I would love if that conversation were sparked. I would also just issue one other challenge. Just read the book of Revelation just once. Mm, If you're like me, 
you hadn't read it in years and you've avoided this crazy, confusing, even sometimes gory and graphic book, read it again in light of a better understanding of genre and worship of the lamb. It is so rich and amazing in that light. It really, really is. Well, I can't wait until our next conversation. Our next book is Revelation Through Old Testament Eyes, and I am incredibly excited to see the richness of the ways in which the book of Revelation fulfills and and kind of brings to a culmination all the imagery and ideas of the Old Testament. Yeah, it's going to be such a good conversation and and a good book like i we haven't we don't even know what we don't know yet so i'm i'm exactly. so excited but uh well as we always do we want to end the episode on a little bit lighter of a note we can take a deep breath a little bit and this week we have a wonderful which josh question mm-hmm. and that is which josh spends hours every week at hobby lobby and that is me, Josh from Missouri. There are two Hobby Lobbies in my town, and I actually have a preferred Hobby Lobby. That's how much time (laughs) I spend at Hobby Lobby. Um, Oh my gosh. Yes. Uh, Okay. You have to defend yourself because I feel like this is just a little ploy to just get into heaven. Like you do just like eat at Chick-fil-A and then go to Hobby Lobby and then be like, yeah, that's it. I've done my, I've done my my Christian Christian duty for the week. I do that instead of reading the Bible and praying. Yep. Um, Okay. All right. Yeah. So no. uh, So quite some time ago, my daughter and I were having a kind of difficult moment and I just said, Hey, I, if we're going to, navigate this well in the future. I need to spend more time with you. What do you want to do? If we just set aside a couple of hours every week to do whatever you want, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to go with you and wander around in stores and look at stuff. Huh. And I said, okay, that is not something that would have occurred to me. I was like, and I was confused, like what stores? I was like, so you want to like go walk around in the mall? She's like, no, I hate the mall. I said, okay. (laughs) And it has evolved into just about every single week we go to Hobby Lobby. We know the staff there. We know the store intimately. And we just wander around. She loves crafty things. And we talk about the crafty things that we see. Uh, And she just talks about what she wants to do with them and the crafts she wants to make and how she thinks they would be cool to buy and just they start a conversation and we have this hour, two hour long conversation about random things as mediated by the aisles of Hobby Lobby. That is awesome. I was originally going to give you a hard time about being in Hobby Lobby, but the you can't, whole can experience. You? No, not really. No. Um, <laughs> A, you're spending time with your daughter, which is wonderful. And B, you're describing an experience that I have all the time. Shelly and I, we go antiquing pretty frequently as a part of our dates. And this is a huge example of the the exact same thing. We wander around in stores and we allow the objects that we see to spark a conversation. That's just what we do. Um, and that's just what antiquing is for us. So you mm-hmm. just you're just applying it to crafts. That's exactly it. It, it. At the end of the day, I needed a way to enter her world. And this is what worked. And so this is what we do. And that's cool. It's been great. It's really fun. And she loves it. And I love it. And so all is well with the world. Nice. And also all is well with Hobby Lobby because we end up buying something. But. You know. <laughs> all right. Well, normally at this moment, we say, do you want to talk again next week? But it will probably be another couple of months before we talk about the next book. So uh, yeah, you want to talk again next time? Yes. Well, we'll talk again next week. It just won't be about Revelation and it will be in its normal spot in our order of publication. So yes, yes. I look forward to it. All right. Very good. Well, then we will talk then. Thanks for a great conversation. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye. 
Bye.